Open in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. As we turn there, I want to share with you that this morning uh, someone was talking to me on their way out, and they said, oh, they said, it's kind of negative, isn't it? All those bad things that are headed toward us in the world. And he said, it, it should be good to go out of church and be all excited instead of, you know, thinking about the gloom and the doom. And I thought about that in perspective, and I guess the gloom and doom does excite me because of these few verses I'd like to read to you in Second Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Sounds pretty negative, doesn't it? Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning. He repeats it. And the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in the which righteousness will dwell. I think to get the proper focus on prophecy, eschatology, end times, judgment, tribulation, gloom, and doom is to look at the purpose and the goal and the inevitable result of those things. Peter, who was not one to, to write too much, he wrote two very small and uh, a little bit uh, difficult to understand in places epistles, but he very clearly says that a framework that he lived in was he knew that everything was going to be destroyed. He knew that God's timetable was in place. And he rejoiced in it because he saw that that was just an intermediate step for the ultimate, which is the new heavens, the new earth, where no sin and righteousness dwells. And on that note, we are going to now go back to Daniel chapter 9 and take a running start from Daniel 9 and actually go through this whole period of time that Peter is talking about. He's talking about the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is the Old Testament description of this entire period of time, which is God's final dealing with mankind encircling those very special people called the Jews. And Daniel describes, beginning in verse 24, an outline of history. And if you have uh, known this in the past, it's good to be refreshed if if perhaps you're new in the faith or maybe you've not paid attention before, it's a good framework to understand how we know that there is a future event coming which is called the tribulation or the time of Jacob's troubles. Beginning in verse 24, I want to look at it in three perspectives. First of all, the precise start of the 70 weeks. I read to you in verse 25, the first part. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now remember, we know exactly when this began. This is a very precise historical date, March 14th, 445. Artaxerxes, the head of the Oriental Kingdom of the Medes and Persians, issued this decree. And so Daniel's 70 weeks of history, 490 years of history, begin on that day. Then there's a unique conclusion. Look at the rest of verse 25, because it reveals that from the time of the going forth of Artaxerxes' commandments, and I continue with Daniel, unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And of course, that adds up to 69 weeks, leaving one week of seven years remaining. Now, I shared with you that God was giving an exact time frame for the Jews to understand. He said that from that date that the walls and the city were rebuilt until 483 years in the future, in that time period, when that was expired, the Messiah was going to come. Now, what's amazing is they all had forgotten about this because when Christ came, nobody knew 
or expected his arrival, except for those few open-hearted shepherds and those foreign eastern magis, but no one else except perhaps a couple, Anna and uh, Simeon, in the temple. But the scriptures tell us, and Sir Robert Anderson calculated, that to the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that incredible morning of, of the coronation day when they said, we want you to be our king, and they cast their palm branches before him, which would have been the first uh, week of April of 32 A.D., exactly that fits in that time frame. And if you are one of these people that loves to read that, there is uh, The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson and also Harold Honer's book, uh, which talks about the chronology of the scriptures. These two men disagree by two years, but uh, how they resolve that is the fact that when the calendars were adjusted during uh, Gregory the Great, the, the pope who oversaw the, the uh, calibration of our calendar, they just didn't know what to do with a, a few of the years, and so there are some overlooked years. So it really doesn't matter whether it was A.D. 32 or A.D. 30, because one leaves in two years from the old Julian calendar, and the other takes it out, so they exactly come to the same time. But you might say, what's significant about all those numbers? Why would, would God be concerned with that? I think that's important, because we find, and if you look back at the beginning of chapter 9, we find that God, in Daniel 9, verse 2, was dealing with old Daniel to show him how precise and accurate and literal God's prophetic utterances were. It says in verse 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah has a very long book in the Old Testament. And within that book, it says that Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. Now, if Daniel had followed some current thoughts, he would have said, well, 70 means something other than 70, and so it means they're going to be in captivity for a long time. But what does 70 mean? It meant 70. And he calculated it out, and his whole prayer, beginning in verse 3 and all the way through verse 19, is based on the fact, he said, God, you have been precisely accurate in the past, those 70 years are nearly up. When are we going to go home? When are we going to leave our captivity? In the midst of that type of precise Bible study taken literally, God gives him this prophecy from verse 24 to verse 27. So, first of all, it shows that God's prophecies are accurate, and secondly, it shows that biblical prophecy can be taken literally. And as Daniel took it literally, and as Daniel adhered to literal interpretation, so we should be very careful to also take as the first sense of the Scripture, and one of the, the golden rules of interpreting the Scripture is, if the plain, literal sense makes common sense, it's the best sense. In other words, before you try and start making everything mean something else, just take it for what it says. And most often, we're correct. But the third aspect, not only was this prophecy in verse 24 have a unique and very precise beginning and a very unique and precise ending with Christ riding in, but also Christ's death after the 69th week is foretold. If you notice in verse 26, it says that after the 62 weeks, that's the, the 62 plus 7, he's already mentioned the 7, after this time period is over, Messiah will be cut off. After this great advent of Christ as to, after he came to be received as king, the Jews rejected him, and God had to put on hold his plan for the Jews. You say, oh, did he make a mistake? No. Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Christ was ordained to be crucified on that day by God's great timetable, but God offered to Israel a great promise, and they rejected it. And that's why their hearts have been in darkness and there's a veil over their hearts even to this day because they've rejected their Messiah. But Christ, it says in verse 26, was crucified or he was cut off, but not for himself. That's very interesting that it puts it that way. He was cut off and have nothing or literally and not for himself. He didn't die because his plans were foiled. He died not for himself, but for the sins of the world. 
And Daniel was even here predictively speaking of that. And then, of course, the, the Romans came in and destroyed the city. Now, we see what has happened in 69 of those weeks, 483 of those years. But as you see in verse 27, there's one segment to go. Now, there are those that say that it took place after the death of Christ and his burial and his resurrection. That would have put it somewhere between 37 and 39 A.D. I ask you a question. Did the millennium start then? And if so, uh, when, did, when did the lion lay down beside the calf? And when did the, the curse get removed from the earth? It hasn't. And when did Christ come down and literally rule on the earth? He didn't. For you see... There's a a gap here. There's a parenthesis. There is a a time which God in his providence has allowed for the gospel to come out. And that time frame, after Christ was cut off and crucified and did the work on Calvary, that time, until its conclusion at the rapture, we call the church age. It's the time which God is operating in and through the church. Now, before that time, he operated in and through Israel. After that time, he's going to again operate in and through Israel. But right now, it says in Romans 9 through 11, God has set aside and grafted us who are in. He set aside Israel, grafted in Gentiles, the church. That's God's plan. The church age ends at the rapture. But some of you might be asking, how can we differentiate between the second coming of Christ and the rapture? That's been a real job for many centuries, for many people. The early church believed in the any moment return of Christ. The apostles believed in that. The early fathers believed in that. But somewhere in that second, third century, it kind of got muddled, especially when St. Augustine said that the city of God is here on earth. And all of a sudden, people quit looking up and they started looking down. And they started looking around, and they stopped expecting Christ to return, and they started thinking they were going to build the kingdom themselves. And from that time on, the any moment return of Christ came and went, but it was often an ignored doctrine. But I want to share with you eight contrasts between the rapture and the second coming. For those of you that maybe are still battling with this, because it's okay, uh, prophecy is perhaps one of the least understood, and yet most expansive elements of the Bible. One-third of the Bible is prophetic, and there's much considerable disagreement over things. But let me just share with you, and you make your own decision, the contrast in the Scripture between these two events, okay? Eight contrasts between the glorious, very visible return of Jesus Christ, called the Second Coming, and the very special return for his believing bride, the church, called the rapture or the snatching away. Okay, eight contrasts. At the rapture, it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, the saints meet Christ in the air. That's interesting. At the second coming in Zechariah, it says Christ comes and stands on the earth. A real contrast there. The air, the earth. Second contrast is at the rapture, the Mount of Olives is untouched and not even mentioned. At the second coming, the Mount of Olives splits in half. Now, Paul doesn't say anything about that in 1 Corinthians 15 or in 1 Thessalonians 4. He just says Christ comes and sweeps those of us who believe out of the earth into the air. It says in other passages that Christ comes and literally hits the earth, and he returns at Jerusalem, and when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, it cleaves in two. Thirdly, the rapture, living saints are translated Dead saints are raised and given resurrection bodies. At the second coming, there's no mention of saints. It's only of judgment. It's only of the piercing eye and the word of Jesus Christ cutting down his enemies before him. Fourthly, at the rapture, the body goes to heaven. It says, and so shall we be with the Lord. What's interesting, at the second coming, it says the body comes back to earth. Jesus Christ who took his body out in 1 Thessalonians 4, is seen in Revelation 19 returning with all the saints behind him in beautiful white garments. Fifthly, at the rapture, Christ comes for his saints, and at the second coming, he returns. 
with his saints. Sixthly, at the rapture, the world is not judged and sin gets worse. If you read the chronology of 1 Thessalonians 4, Jesus Christ takes the saints out of the earth. Chapter 5, it says that the darkest hours of the earth start coming upon them. And there is apostasy and sin rampant. At the second coming, the world is judged and sin is dealt with on the spot. A great contrast there. Seventh, the rapture is not preceded by any detailed signs or warnings. There is no indication it's going to occur. It's an instantaneous, unexpected arrival. The second coming is preceded by specific, detailed signs. There will be signs in the heavens, signs in the earth. There will be all types of cosmic disturbances, and there will be an exact time period of 84 months, seven long years. And the last 42 months, every single event is charted out. And at the end of that last event, at the exact moment, Christ returns. That's two different returns. If you really read the scriptures, literally, there are no signs for the one. There are many signs for the other. And finally, in every passage dealing with this coming of Christ to snatch his saints out, it's only a dealing with the saved, with the redeemed. But the second coming brings the saved and is totally dealing only with the lost and with destroying them before they destroy Israel. But now let's look at the tribulation hour because that's what our whole focus is tonight. We've already seen from Daniel 9 that it is a definable period of seven years. Now turn over to Revelation just briefly. I want to show you again how we get to the seven years. Revelation thir- or chapter 11 uh, verses 2 and 3. Because not only does Daniel say it's seven years, but numerous other passages of the Scripture define it as being a, an exact seven-year, 84-month, divided in half, two 42-month section period of time. It says in Revelation 11, 2 and 3, uh, this is a, a little aside, talking about the two witnesses who God sends down to testify for him during the tribulation hour. Verse 2, and leave the courts, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread it underfoot, the holy city, 42 months. And I will grant authority to the two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, which again is 42 months. Now we know when this occurs, and this occurs for only one half of the tribulation. If you just multiply this times two, you realize that the book of Revelation completely chronicles the entire seven-year period of time. Now, God describes, and uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to really wear you out tonight, but turn back to Zechariah. If you can find Matthew, go two books behind it. Zechariah, not one of the more notable books of the Bible by any means, but in Zechariah, we have, in verse 12, the description of, of the ultimate climactic moment, Zechariah chapter 12, excuse me, in verse 1 and then verse 10. I don't want to read the whole passage, but Zechariah chapter 1, verse, or excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Now listen. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. And now he tells what the tribulation hour is going to be like. Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. And he goes on and on describing some of the events. But look at the climactic moment in verse 10. Because in that instant, the book of Revelation, as it's harmonized with this passage and many others, says that at the climax of the tribulation hour, the Antichrist and his forces that are remaining encircle Jerusalem, and they're coming to close in and to kill the last group of Jews left. And in that moment, those Jews realize there's nowhere to turn. And then verse 10 of chapter 12 of Zechariah takes place. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and 
and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of the firstborn. In that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem. And on and on it goes. And in that instant when there's nowhere else to look, it's going to be an exciting thing for all of us to see as we come with the Lord. Because those Jews that have had their eyes closed for centuries, who have resisted to the death and said they will not accept Jesus Christ as Messiah, when they see the armies encircling Jerusalem, and when they see no hope and their life is to be cut off, in that instant they look up. And in that instant, God pours out the grace of the Holy Spirit and he opens their hearts and they see the one coming on that white horse and who they see is that one who they pierced and they mourn for him nationally and they turn in faith and believe on him. And that's what Paul was talking about in Romans 11 where he says, and so all Israel will be saved. All that group, that entire remnant, that entire body of people that are remaining of Israel, in that instant look at Christ, and they believe on him, and he destroys all their enemies in that instant. What a powerful portrait. Let's look at Jesus' description. That was uh, the Old Testament prophets. In Matthew 24, Matthew 24, from the Jews' perspective, Just about all that it is is it's a horrible time, they're getting wiped out, and at the last moment they believe on Christ. However, our Lord Jesus Christ, in answering the disciples and apostles' questions, goes into a bit more detail in Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 begins with a beautiful question that the disciples ask. You see, he had question and answer times in private for them. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, fitting place to sit, that's where he was going to return to at the instant of the second coming. And when Jerusalem does look and does mourn and does see him and does turn to him, Christ comes down and actually touches his feet on the Mount of Olives, destroying all the armies of the world that are encircling Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives splits open and a river starts flowing in two directions one toward the Dead Sea, the other toward the Mediterranean, right out of that mountain. But now let's look at Christ answering their questions on that very memorable site of the Mount of Olives. And his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Boy, they're asking all the right questions, aren't they? And let's listen to the greatest teacher of all time talking about it. First of all, he describes in verses 4 through 8 the first half of the tribulation. He says in verse 4 and 5 that there will be great deception by many false Christs. And if we aren't entering into that, we are getting so close to, to the time because there are increasing numbers of people that are saying, listen to me, I saw a vision, I heard a word, some apparition spoke to me, this is from God, uh, It's amazing how much there's been in history, but Christ said during this fateful time there will be great deception by many false Christs. And they will not just say that they're a prophet or they're a Maharaji so-and-so. They will say, I'm Jesus Christ. And what's amazing, during this time they actually find followings. Secondly, there are wars and rumors of wars. In verses 6 and 7, He talks about that. Did you know that even since World War II ended, there have been no less than 137 battles, wars fought in this world with 12 million casualties in the last 45 years? But he says there's going to be an increasing amount of wars and rumors of war in this time. And then thirdly, there will be famine, pestilence, and earthquake, the last part of verse 7. It says that there will be an incredible outpouring of famine. There are millions that are on the verge of starvation. There are hundreds of thousands that die of starvation just in Africa alone and incredible scores in some of the third world countries such as India. But during this time period, it's going to be all emphasized. But 
Verse 8 says, all of these are the beginning of sorrows. What he's saying is this is just the start, folks. And that's why we look at this as just the first half of the tribulation, because the first half is relatively mild until we get to the second half. Let's get to the second half, verse 9 through 14. Because starting in verse 9, there is persecution and martyrdom. We don't read in the book of Revelation about the tribulation hour having martyrdom until we get to the middle. And when the Antichrist shows his true colors, this leader of the United Europe, and as he starts persecuting believers and the Jews alike, martyrdom takes place. And thus, that's why many Bible commentators believe that the great tribulation begins in verse 9. The second half begins here. Verse 10 says there's betrayal and hatred. In other words, it's the whole idea of the Antichrist enlisting people to to squeal on others and say, I found someone like they found Daniel praying three times a day from his rooftop as he opened that window. So people all over the world are going to be spying, looking for Christians, and there's going to be betraying of one another and hatred. And then in verse 11, we see that there is even greater deception by many false prophets. As it says, and false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And this is very much spoken about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 12, as it describes there the fact that because the restraining influence and the godliness of the Holy Spirit indwelling Christians has been removed from this world, that demonic deception is going to run rampant. We seem to not be so aware of how prevalent demonic activity is even to this day. Some of the most Best-selling books in recent years have been traced back to medium writing. Uh, I remember back when I was in high school, a real popular book that everyone was reading was Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And when Bach was approached and asked how he wrote such a, a motivating book, he tells the story in the news magazines of how he was walking down the beaches of England and how as he was walking there, he heard a voice behind him. He turned around. There was no one there. And the voice said, I want to tell you something. Write it down. So he went home, and he said that his fingers were literally captivated to the typewriter, and he wrote the entire book without any thought. And it became an incredible, immediate, very bestseller. That's not uncommon. In the Red Book and also in the McCall's Magazine, there were articles about some of these very good-selling romantic novels set in ancient times that the authors, the women, say, I sat down, my hand seemed to take off, and it never stopped. And I wrote page after page after page. And these women have sold books into the hundreds of thousands and millions of copies. Demonic influence is present now. It's withheld. It will be prevalent and rampant. But fourthly, verse 12 says that many phony believers will depart from the truth. In other words, this cold, dead, liberal church that will be remaining in this world, that will explain away why all the Christians left, all of a sudden people will start bailing out of that church as soon as they find out there's a price to pay for what they don't believe. And because of the lawlessness is increased and the pressure is exerted, most people's love will grow cold. They'll bail out. But throughout this time, there will be believers And even though all those who are believing in that instant are removed, God has called a group of people to be witnesses. And the book of the Revelation talks about those 144,000 very literal Jews who will testify throughout the whole earth. Verse 13 describes some of their, their converts, but the one who endures to the end, it is he who shall be saved. Because true faith never stops believing It might waver, it might doubt, but as 1 John tells us, believing faith never, never dies. And they endure to the end. Sixthly, the two witnesses and the Jews really have an evangelistic blitz. And it says in verse 14, those two witnesses we read about in Revelation 11 a few minutes ago, and the 144,000, they're in Revelation 7 and 14, Right here in Matthew 24:14, it says, And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all nations. And when they get done getting to every corner of this globe, 
Because God's going to protect them. They're going to have a mark upon them where they cannot be killed, where they cannot be injured, when they cannot be at all attacked and, and done away with by the Antichrist forces. When they get all done, the two witnesses, God allows them to be killed and they're taken away. The 144,000 finish their work and they've gone to every realm of this world giving the good news. Well, that was Christ's answer. Now let's look at John's details and let's hasten on to the book of Revelation. We've got a lot of chapters to cover. Because what Daniel saw in Panorama and what the prophets spoke about in brief and what Christ answered questions about, St. John, the beloved apostle, in Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19, gives us exacting details. And I want to remind you that the book of the Revelation has a special blessing attached to it. Blessed are those that read it. Blessed are those that take heed to it, the writer wrote. And the Lord Jesus Christ has attached a special blessing to those who are aware of the promises and beatitudes of this book. And by the way, there are seven beatitudes that are found in the book of Revelation. 404 verses. There are 32 Old Testament books. Nearly every Old Testament book is quoted from in this book. Over 400 allusions to other passages of Scripture. It's the most inscripturated book of the Bible. It ties together nearly every bit of the prophecy of the Old Testament. All those various Hebrew prophets are all tied in to these 404 verses. But John gives some great details. And look at Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17. I want to show you something really interesting. This is is a prayer meeting, by the way. But I want you to see who's praying. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the rocks and the caves and the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, and here's their prayer, Fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of of the Lamb, and the great day of their wrath is come, and who is able to stand? What what an incredible prayer meeting of unbelieving people crying out to be destroyed because they're so fearful. What are they fearful of? Well, beginning in verse 1, we find the successive outpouring of God's wrath on this earth. And I just want to briefly go through this, just give you a little idea of what the tribulation is going to be like. Remember, we're only in an overview and a survey. And someday I'd love to come back and just go through this because there's so much richness, especially as you look back at the Old Testament passages. But let's start with the seven seals. And I want to give you an idea, first of all, what's happening, and then we'll see what's going on. In chapter 5, verse 1, there's the uh, Revelation 5.1. This is what's being unfurled. It's a scroll. And if you think of a scroll, it's like a roll of paper towel rolled up. And so that it could be undone in a certain way, they used to do messages this way. They would write a message out, and then they would roll it up a little bit and seal it so that you couldn't go any further unless you broke the seal. Then they'd write more message, and they'd roll it up some more, and they'd seal it again. Then they'd write some more and roll it up, and you could have innumerable seals, as many as you wanted in a message, And then it's kind of like a security code on a computer. You can only get as far into the database as you have access to. And what happens in this scroll, the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, starts breaking the seals one at a time. And as each seal is broken, the one who has the authority alone to break them, the ruler of heaven and earth, unfurls and unleashes the wrath of God on the earth. Why is he doing this? Well, Revelation chapter 5 says, On the right hand of him, verse 1, who sat on the throne, a book written inside and on the back, that's this idea of these many messages and all the seals, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is able to open this book and to break its seals? And no one was found. And then in verse 5, someone is found. Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has come. And who is that? Verse 6 says, it's the Lamb of God. And he comes in verse 8. He took the book, and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before him. 
and he starts the process of reclaiming the earth. And I want you to see what's happening and get a positive perspective. At the Garden of Eden, man gave up. God gave him the dominion of this world, and he gave it up and came under the curse of sin as he disobeyed God. And Satan became rampantly running, the prince of the power of the air, having his way in this world with God's allowance each step of the way, and has had free reign here until this point. At the cross, Jesus Christ defeated Satan right here at the throne of God with the seven-sealed book. He begins the systematic reclaiming process of the earth, of its people, of its inhabitants, by pouring out his judgment on the unbelieving race of mankind. Now, verse six, or chapter 6, verse 1. Let's open the book. Seal number 1 is in verses 1 and 2. It says, And when I saw the Lamb break one of the seven seals, I heard the four living creatures saying, As with the voice of thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out to conquer and to conquer. And this is the false leader, the false Christ, the ultimate Christ, the Antichrist, most Bible scholars believe. And he starts his conquest. And that's why, again, this aligns with the midpoint of the tribulation as this man has been sitting as the ruler of a united Europe and giving peace and somewhat prosperity to this world as he's combating all the ills. But finally, in the midpoint of the tribulation, he sets his eye on Israel and he sets his eyes on the Christians that are coming about through the witness going on, and he turns, and God unleashes this first seal. The Antichrist rises in his reign. The second seal is war, verses 3 and 4. And they broke the second seal, and the living creatures said, Come, and another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. After 42 months of relative peace, it's removed, that men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. I thought it was interesting that the Dallas Morning News recently shook up the city of Dallas by carrying the first 19 pages of the opening section of the Morning News, which is usually 24 pages long, by carrying 19 pages devoted to the wars which are raging right now around the world. Right now, in 1990... There are about 20 wars going on around the world. Three million people have been killed in those wars. About 90% of them are civilians. A war is defined as strife which results in 1,000 or more deaths per year. In Central America, in Guatemala, there's a war that's been going on since 1966 that's killed 138,000 people. We hardly even hear about it anymore. And that's what we've grown accustomed to, and that's what we're living with. You know what the scriptures say? That's nothing compared to what's going to happen. Because when this seal is broken, absolute anarchy breaks out. Warfare and murder spreads continually about. One estimate in, in a recent report said that there are 143 separate wars that have been fought since World War II, claiming 12 million people. I share with you also that homicides in January of 1990 broke records in eight major cities in America. New York City, 1,896 killings in 1988. Los Angeles, 723. Washington, D.C., 483. And on and on it goes in America. And it's incredible to think of those nations which don't even keep statistics of all that. But what's amazing about this seal being broken in the tribulation hour is not so much the fact that it breaks out, but the intensity at which it breaks out. And let me read to you how intense war itself has become. Some of you experienced, perhaps, World War II. Some of you, perhaps, experienced the Korean War. I know we have a couple of you in the back that were in the Civil War. Ah, just seeing if anybody's still awake. Not really. Uh, I don't think that even Vietnam veterans realize the intensity that war and its lethal weapons has come. And I'm not talking about nuclear weapons. Let me read to you what the 
institute that works on warfare reported. Moreover, the, the lethal nature of modern conventional weapons is virtually incomprehensible. In World War II, the standard infantry rifle, the M1, fired eight rounds in a clip. Today, the M16 fires 30-round magazine, far more devastating end-over-end -end projectiles. Today's M16 is so devastating that a, a tumbling bullet that even hits a shoulder can wipe a person out because of its tumbling effect. It can just tear off the shoulder, whereas in the past they had just injuries and casualties. An A-10 attacked aircraft from World War II, the jet that was used to support, uh, excuse me, a modern A-10 attack aircraft that is used to support ground troops carries a heavier bomb load than the largest bomber of World War II, the B-29. That is a small attack fighter airplane as compared to the largest bomber of World War II. An AC-130 AC gunship transport aircraft configured for fire support carries four cannons, 20 millimeters, with six barrels each, and it goes on and on with a blizzard of how, much, how many bullets per second they can shoot. But the bottom line is this. In other words, one airplane delivers the firepower of an entire battalion of World War II infantry. Just the bullets that one airplane can release in one attack. New explosives invented have rendered, rendered TNT obsolete. Professor Richard Gabriel of St. Anselm's College in his newly published book said this, a Soviet motorized rifle division can deliver ten times the firepower at three times the rate of a World War II division. So we have exponentially at the rate of 30 times increased the intensity and the firepower of just our conventional warfare. But here's the, the interesting result. He contends in his book, the very lethal nature and nonstop intensity of conventional war may make it unendurable, resulting in psychiatric collapse of whole armies in a matter of days. Under such condition, he vows, mental breakdown is not the question of when, or excuse me, not the question of if, but when. He's talking about the intense nature and how rapid warfare goes in our present day and how quickly entire armies can be wiped out. He says that war is at a level that has been unforeseen in past history. Let's look at the next seal because it doesn't get any better. The tribulation hour, the third seal, is famine. In verse 5 it says, When he broke the third seal, that's Revelation 6, 5, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, the third horse now, a black horse. And he who had it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice from the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. What is this talking about? A day's wage for a loaf of bread. Back to the days when there is rampant famine, poverty, and food is scarce. I remind you again of my shopping venture at Super Stop and Shop a few weeks ago when I went in and I could not count. My wife said, get a loaf of bread. I couldn't figure out what kind to get. There must have been 30 or 40 varieties just of the dark breads, let alone the white breads and all the other colors of bread. But the day is coming where the shelves of Eastern Europe will be the shelves of the world, where there's nothing where there's no food, where you work all day just to get enough to survive another day. And as this third seal is broken and famine comes across this world, people will begin to be aware of the unending onslaught of the wrath of God as the planned, orchestrated destruction of earth continues the first Time magazine of 1989 honored the Earth as the person of the year. I don't know if you remember that. It was a very memorable issue about a year and a half ago. Here are the opening lines of that article. It says, As Noah's deluge, the events of 1988 must be reckoned with. 
The message is loud and clear, and suddenly people are beginning to listen and ponder the importance of the message held. In the United States, a three-month drought baked the soil from California to Georgia and reduced the country's grain harvest by one-third. Did you know that in 1988, that drought? Do you remember the hot spell and the drought that hit us? I remember the, the wildfires in California in 88. They were burning all over the place because it was so hot and so dry. And in one three-month period, one-third of our grain was wiped out in America. It continues and says, A stubborn seven-week heat wave drove temperatures above 100 across most of the country, raising fears of the dreaded greenhouse effect. Similar <clears throat> pollution. As the flames went up and the smoke covered the country from forest fires, similar pollution closed beaches in the Mediterranean, the North Sea, and the English Channel. Killer hurricanes ripped through the Caribbean. Floods devastated Bangladesh as three-quarters of a million people were homeless. And in Soviet Armenia, that monstrous earthquake killed 55,000 people. And that was nothing compared to how God is going to unfurl the devastation of a world run amok. I continue with, the revelation that federal weapons plants making radioactive waste and spewing them, literally littering large areas with this radioactive pollution. Further depletion of the ozone layer, which helps block cancer-causing ultraviolet rays, testified to the continued overuse of the atmosphere. And perhaps the most ominous of all, in 1988, the destruction of the tropical forest, home to half of the Earth's plant and animal species, continued at a rate equal to one football field a second around the clock. Now, we're not in the tribulation yet, and this is what's happening to the earth. And those people that were writing this article were very gloomy. But let's go a step further, and they did. They took their computers and they said, what would happen if what's going on in 1988 and 1989 were to go unabated? Did you read the headlines this morning of the Sunday paper? They want to dump all the the iron into the sea to try and make this algae grow. There's no greenhouse effect, but in case there is one, we want to do this, right? That's what the scientists are saying. They don't want to alarm people, but they want to do something. But what would happen if nothing were done about the Earth's imperiled state? I continue reading this article. According to the computer, the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would drive up the planet's average temperature between 3 and 9 degrees. You say, so what? It wouldn't be so cold. That subtle rise in the heat of this planet would cause the oceans to rise by several feet, flooding coastal areas, ruining huge tracts of farmland through salinization. Changing weather patterns could make huge areas infertile and uninhabitable, touching off refuge movements unprecedented in history. They continue. Remember, these are secular people. They start out the article, I didn't even read you, they said there are crazy doomsday Armageddon people out there that are fanatics. We don't believe all that, they just believe this. Um, amazing. Toxic waste and radioactive contamination could lead to a shortage of safe drinking water. Ah, that's coming up here in just a second. As the angels pour out the wrath of God on the oceans and on the rivers and people die from drinking water. It says the world could house between 8 and 14 billion people by the middle of the next century. That's within the lifetime of most of you that are here tonight. Within our lifetime, if nothing is abated, 8 to 14 billion people, and there's a strong likelihood of mass starvation. On and on he goes, and I won't bore you with the details. But what is it saying? Well, scientists have said that what has happened in just the last decade has shown that our world climate can change 100 times faster than they ever envisioned possible in the course of all their meteorological studies of this earth. It can change at a rate 100 times faster. And we're talking about rates of change. Stephen Schneider of the National Center for Atmospheric Research of the U.S. government. Climactic changes... 100 times faster than any time in human history. He said the heat waves, the droughts, and the floods, and the hurricanes may be a preview of what would happen with the temperature rise of just 3 to 8 degrees. The fourth seal, 
verses 7 and 8. And when he broke the fourth seal, he heard a voice, the living creature, saying, Come. And we have here death as it begins lurching across this world. And with the breaking of this seal, one-fourth of the population of the world is going to die. It says, In a fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and hunger and death one-fourth of the people on this earth. Let me read to you what that's like in a third world nation. Just briefly, the starvation and the rampage of death that we know very little of. Close to Zacalo, Mexico City's great central square is the barrio of Morelos, a vast warren of dusty, potholed streets and narrow entryways. Passages lead to gloomy worlds. On each side of the roofless patio is a ten-room jumble. Each room holds a family. Each family averages five people. The only bathroom, there are two of them, serves 100 people each in these barrios and infested areas of Mexico City. They are located at the back of the patio. The odor of grease and the stench of sewerage permeate the air. Flies buzz relentlessly, and the people who live here are considered lucky. Why? Because the shanty towns on Mexico City's outskirts have tens of thousands of people living in shelters of cardboard and aluminum. There is no running water, no sanitation, the stench is overpowering, garbage and human waste heap up in piles, and rats roam freely like stray domestic animals. That's today. That's Mexico City. That's a $199 plane fare from here. And God says that that's what the whole world is going to be enmeshed in in the days that are coming. Well, the gloomy people go on and on. But let me just conclude, because we don't have time to go through the rest of the tribulation, to tell you this, that there are seven seals and the blowing of seven trumpets through verse or through chapter 11. Then in chapter 10, there is the ongoing rolling of seven thunders. And then there are seven bowls of wrath that are poured out in Revelation 16. And by the end, you would think that the world would all be crawling on their knees toward Jerusalem and saying, what must we do to be saved? Please stop. We believe. In fact, it says in Revelation, in another passage, that at the height of all this, as the world is falling in, as people are dying by the scores, as it's just relentless, no one seems to hope for life. In that instant, an angel flies, proclaiming the everlasting gospel all throughout the entire earth. And the people stop their ears and refuse to listen. And they head ominously onward under the Antichrist rule until we come to Armageddon. And you all know what Armageddon is in chapter 16 and the total destruction of those people. But let me just conclude our night with this. What is the purpose of the tribulation? I bet you're wondering that now after all this awful stuff. And I only went through four seals. You ought to go through the whole thing. It's enough to, to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It's terrible. What's the purpose of it? There are four purposes. First of all, for Israel, it's to get them to the end of themselves at last. It's to judge them for their unbelief, and it's to bring them to the point where they turn to Christ. Secondly, for the Gentiles, it's a judgment on their total, persistent unbelief, and it's also the greatest time of salvation. In fact, out of the tribulation hour, a multitude comes, which we read about in chapter 7 and again in 14, an incredible multitude, if you want to look at Revelation 7 and verse 9, after this I looked in a great multitude from every tribe and nation and kindred and tongue, standing in white robes, and that's the symbol that they were martyrs and they're coming up out of the tribulation. And this is what they're crying in verse 10. Salvation to our God who sits on the throne. And they go into verse 12. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. For the Jews, judgment and salvation. For the Gentiles, judgment of those who won't turn in, in belief to Christ and salvation, martyrdom, and glorious white robes at the throne of the Lamb of God for those that do. Thirdly, the purpose of the tribulation is for sin 
and Satan, the devil. And actually, the tribulation is God's way, as one writer put it, of letting sin run its full course so that God can crush it. Sin is going to run unabated throughout the earth for those last 42 months. And it's going to be so horrible that it's going to even shock mankind with its utter horrific nature. It's also a time for Satan to gather the whole realm together and attack God with everything he has and still come up a loser. So it's very important for the Jews to get saved and judged. It's important for the Gentiles to get judged and some saved. It's important for Satan to finally have ultimate free reign of the whole world any way he wants with no spirit of God and dwelling believers hindering him. No restraint and he's still a loser. And finally, it's an example to us. And let me close with this. The tribulation shows us how much God hates sin with an absolute eternal hatred. He cannot tolerate its existence in his presence and so ultimately he will destroy and condemn every sinner who is not cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. There are four purposes for the tribulation. I hope that its purposes for us will sink deeply in our hearts as we ponder God's wrath on this sinful world. Turn back to Revelation 5. For this, even more fitting, is going to be our eternal occupation, worshiping the Lamb. Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. Who are these? These are those encircling us, those who have come up out of the earth, those who have been snatched before the wrath of God hits this world. And the, the living creatures and the elders, and a number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever and the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped